Um, welcome, everybody, and welcome to the next session of the Probabilistic uh, Machine Learning Reading Group. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about decision trees, boosting and bagging. And we're um, really, really um, honored to have uh, Dr. William Hsu, who's a professor at the University, Kansas University, um, presenting the material today. So um, without further ado, um, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm at Kansas State University. Um, my name is Bill Shu. Um, I teach a machine learning class and an introductory artificial intelligence class. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So today I'm going to present book one, chapter 18 of Kevin Murphy's Probabilistic Machine Learning book uh, on trees, forests, bagging, and boosting. Uh, my name is Bill Chu. Uh, I'm the principal investigator of the Lab for Knowledge Discovery and Databases, which is part of a cluster called uh, CADES, the Center for AI and Data Science in the Department of Computer Science at Kansas State University. Uh, this uh, lecture is online. Um, the slides are at the uh, URL at the bottom. Um, I have first uh, wanted to start by acknowledging um, some outside references on decision trees, uh, mostly Tom Mitchell's book. And uh, it, I use uh, some notation um, from his book in addition to the um, notation that uh, Kevin Murphy derives. And um, it'll be very clear from the slides where I'm using um, Tom's notation. Uh, but uh, for most of this uh, lecture, I'm going to be following uh, Kevin's outline of chapter 18, which has six parts. Uh, I'm going to go through a quick review on decision tree learning in context. Um, just to catch everybody up, I know there's been chapters on supervised classification and regression, so I'll um, cut to the chase and go over decision trees as a non-parametric model and um, summarize some of the uh, advantages that uh, Kevin talks about. Um, and we'll talk about rule and tree post pruning um, and then begin uh, chapter 18 proper on classification and regression trees. Uh, I'll go over the actual CART formulas, um, both Gini index and entropy or information gain. Um, one of the reasons why I uh, use uh, some material where I redrew slides from Mitchell's book is because uh, Tom presents um, entropy first. Uh, and I think that's actually a good way to introduce ID3. Um, so I'll talk about ID3 and then CART and what the differences are. Uh, this is a very Bryman intensive uh, chapter. Uh, Leo Bryman was at uh, I think UCSD um, and he uh, discovered bagging um, and developed uh, the random forest model. So we'll talk about ensemble learning first and stacking as an exemplar of uh, ensemble learning, then bagging random forests and boosting. Um, I'll talk about uh, how to visualize tree ensembles. This section that's titled Interpreting Tree Ensembles is mostly on graphical visualizations and then present some modern implementations in scikit-learn uh, and show you how to get at the uh, various decision tree options and the uh, wrapped inducers in scikit-learn. I'll also mention uh, some of the implementations such as J48 in Weka. And, uh, and the implementation that's in MLlib, which is the PySpark and Spark-based uh, Apache implementation uh, that replaced, recently replaced up the Mahout. So uh, to start with, uh, just a little bit of notation to catch us up. Uh, we're working with instances that are rows or tuples of data, um, usually written X with an overbar or just a bold X in vector notation, uh, which consists of uh, a tuple or corresponds to a tuple, uh, 
uh, of attribute values. Usually, uh, they are uh, the attribute, the actual tuples are indexed one through M, um, if there are M rows of data, uh, with XJI being um, I, having uh, corresponding to I between one and N, um, where M is the number of columns and the number of attributes. So the dimension N of the instance space, such that X uh, is, is a, um, an arbitrary unlabeled instance uh, in it, uh, is uh, the, uh, the instance space, it has dimension n and a data set consists of these vectors. Um, so clustering consists of mapping from x to x prime, where x prime has dimension k, sometimes much, much less than n, uh, with the exception of support vector machines, right? So we've had this uh, linear discriminant analysis chapter where k is actually greater than n um, and the kernel trick um, is best exploited when you can actually project into a higher dimension space such that there's linear separability or separability using some simpler um, and easier to uh, fit polytope. So the attributes xi prime of these new instances are not necessarily named and we're projecting in this case into a lower dimension x and I'll mention why we're why uh, I bring up clustering since this chapter is entirely on supervised learning. Right? Um, and that is because random forests use a subset of K features. And it actually gets a side benefit of feature subset selection, much as clustering does uh, with the difference that clustering usually entails dimensionality reduction by feature extraction or feature construction rather than selection. Um, so, um, in our research, we do a lot of work with feature extraction, um, autoencoders, variational autoencoders, and also feature selection using uh, just traditional subset selection search uh, or feature importance. And that's a wrapper technique that has been around uh, quite, quite uh, uh, several decades now. So uh, the focus of this chapter, of course, is on classification and regression. So regression takes an independent variable, uh, x, um, a set of dependent variables, y, uh, which are held to be, or, or um, which uh, represent uh, a mapping or are instances of a mapping, um, f of x, uh, and the object is to fit f using an approximate f hat. Classification is similar to regression, except that f is usually denoted c and its Boolean or nominal value. And these can be a logical formula. What we're going to see is that decision trees uh, can encode any propositional formula because um, it can express a disjunct and normal form. Uh, and so what we're going to see is first, um, the, the techniques of supervised classification and regression um, under which decision trees fall, under whose rubric decision trees fall, and then we'll look at the actual ID3 algorithm. So the general, general generic supervised classification problem consists of inputs x1 through xn, as I mentioned, y, which is x, f of x1 through xn, and trying to I, identify the unknown function. Um, so in this case, we have Boolean x, each xi is of type uh, t or ti, and we have an input uh, xi of type ti. Each input xi, uh, is, uh, xi has type ti, a desired output y of type t, and a target function f which is uh, from tuples, T1 cross T2 up to Tn, uh, arrow, that should be a, a right arrow there, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to T. So the learning function takes a vector of labeled examples and returns a hypothesis, right? So it returns an upward function argument or a, uh, a first class function um, that uh, is F hat. So the right-hand side, T1 cross T2 cross uh, T3 up to Tn, arrow T is our closure as it were. Right? So we return this closure and it is a lambda mu x. Okay, um, it takes an unlabeled instance and gives us back x. Any questions? So let's take a look at some of the uh, criteria for using decision trees. And I rewrote this slide from my machine learning course for CART because decision trees usually means decision tree classifiers. 
the instances are describable by attribute value pairs. And that's true whether it's numeric data or qualitative data or nominal data. The classification target function is nominal, categorical, or discretized. Okay, we'll talk about discretization methods. The, the, in regression, the target function is continuous, right? So depending on whether we're trying to do classification or regression with the decision tree, there's different types of target functions. Uh, we might need a disjunctive hypothesis as a function of the original input features. Uh, the features, the actual uh, regression target or classification target may involve some noise. In classification, that means inconsistently labeled data. Uh, or spuriously labeled data. And in regression, there may be some approximation error, just observation error for the approximation task. So examples of this include diagnostic tasks, um, many risk analysis tasks that can be reduced to classification, including credit um, approval, loan approval, uh, risk uh, credit risk categorization and risk categorization such as in insurance, uh, looking at expected loss ratio, expected um, paid loss, uh, consumer fraud, uh, and, and also regression that uh, comes as the form of, comes in the form of uh, some kind of probabilistic uh, estimation. Okay, so we're actually estimating a probability distribution. Um, so this includes tasks such as consumer fraud and employee fraud, uh, and can even be applied to preference-based ranking. So if we're trying to predict uh, the number of conflicts uh, in a calendar, so if we're, we've got a when to meet or a, a um, doodle poll, uh, and there are some respondents already, and we want to rule out other, um, other uh, possible time slots because enough conflicts have already been detected, we're trying to extrapolate to the future, uh, that's a probability estimation problem, but um, it can be also cast as a, a rank prediction or a rank estimation task, ordinal rank estimation task. So these are all examples of when we might use decision trees. Uh, in supervised inductive learning, we have uh, training examples, x and f of x as a pair. Uh, so this dyad uh, uh, angle brackets are, are not a catch, but, uh, but, a, uh, but to note just a pair, um, but it's a pair with a tuple and usually a univariate target uh, for some unknown function f. And uh, we're trying to find a good approximation at hat, where x is a set of properties of a patient from their EMR, electronic medical records, their medical history, symptoms, lab tests. In differential diagnosis, x can change over time from, and values can be unknown initially and become known. And the process is still to infer f um, as a, uh, detected syndrome uh, or a prognosis or a recommended therapy, right? So depending on whether it's prognosis or diagnosis, um, there, there are different uh, classification targets. Risk assessment uh, takes input in the form of consumer or policyholder demographics, accident, accident histories, and predicts a risk level, which is the expected cost in terms of loss, pay, expected paid loss or loss ratio, as I mentioned. Um, in the domain of self-driving cars, if you look at Carnegie Mellon's um, Alvin, um, that was a regression target. Uh, but one of the versions that's uh, shown in Mitchell's chapter on uh, decision tree induction, chapter uh, or on uh, neural networks rather, uh, chapter four, actually has a winner-take-all uh, set of 30 outputs, each of which is basically a graduation of the steering wheel. So the number of degrees to turn the steering wheel left or right, where um, either 360 or 720 degrees are all divided into um, between six and 12 degrees. Um, another uh, example of classification that's very well known now is part of speech tagging. Uh, this is done using everything from perceptrons and linear threshold gates to uh, conditional random fields uh, to uh, now um, BERT type model, sequence to sequence uh, generative models. But in order to understand the basic task, we should start with uh, the classical methods. Uh, in this case, perceptron is a classical method. Another classical method is using a decision tree. And Eric Brill uh, did uh, a lot of the early work on what he called transformation-based learning uh, using 
uh, using decision trees as the base inducer. Uh, in computer security, there's of course uh, a lot of attempts to do fraud and intrusion detection um, that are very naive, uh, but uh, a much more theoretically grounded method is to, uh, more, much more logically grounded method is to use data log uh, to model attack graphs. And data log of course can represent uh, or consists of data log uh, when I teach it in uh, databases, uh, I introduce it as a application of um, a domain relational calculus, uh, but it's also a way to express positive definite horn clauses. So attack graph modeling, you might say, well, what does that have to do with, uh, with decision tree induction? Uh, there's a algorithm called FOIL, uh, which is first order inductive learning uh, that actually learns uh, positive definite horn clauses uh, by induction using um, at its core an entropy based um, uh, decision tree induction uh, algorithm, uh, just like ID3. Uh, and so I'm going to show you ID3, and it's going to have uh, quite a few other uses, including rule learning um, in both propositional and first order domains. Um, information extraction um, uses document clustering, but also sometimes uses uh, decision trees and other supervised methods as a uh, follow-up tasks. So we do unsupervised learning in order to have class labels that we then impute uh, by, uh, by supervised learning or semi-supervised methods. Um, similarly with social network, um, link analysis, link uh, prediction especially, sentiment analysis at the word level or n-gram level, multi-sensor integration um, is often done using CART uh, and CHAID, which is a, a related method that we won't go into today. Um, but I wanted to focus on uh, first ID3, then CART. So are there any questions about this context? Uh, we've seen in this reading group, um, several different kinds of loss functions, J theta. Um, cross entropy is one. Um, and for classification, uh, there is soft max loss. Uh, there's uh, basically the, uh, uh, the training examples themselves we can use to, uh, to do zero one loss. Uh, and in regression, there's mean squared error um, and mean absolute error. So we're going to look at mean squared error as a regression target. And from the probabilistic framework of max likelihood estimation, we're going to look at how uh, the uh, different kinds of decision tree induction algorithms are derived in terms of minimizing that loss function. Now, what Murphy starts with that, or he starts with looking at either exponential loss or soft max loss or mean squared loss and differentiating that loss in order to get a gradient just as we do with uh, just as we do with logistic and linear regression especially delta rule learning um, using in, in linear discriminant analysis um, however uh, there's another way to look at uh, id3 which is uh, as a uh, partitioning based classification learning system. And so we're going to look at top-down partitioning of the uh, set of examples. All right, so continuing on, let's take a look at the algorithm itself. It's, this is ID3, uh, which Mitchell calls build decision tree. Uh, it takes as arguments the entire set data set D of examples we saw before, the entire set A of attributes. If all the examples, the base cases are as follows, right? If all the examples uh, have the same label, then we simply return the majority label. Okay, um, so here, um, if all the examples have the same label, we return the leaf node, rather we return the leaf node with that label. If we've run out of attributes to test, then we return the majority label. And otherwise, we're going to recurse. And by recursing, we're going to, in recursing, we're going to choose the best attribute from the set of available ones as the root for every value of that, we're going to create a branch out of the root with condition A equals B. And um, if the set of examples such that, um, stop annotating here. If the set of examples such that X dot A equals B is empty, then we return the majority label. Now that's the branch, right? Uh, how do we express this branch in database notation? Right? In database notation, it's sigma X, dot in relational algebra notation, sigma x dot a equals v, 
right? The predicate is a, x dot a equals v. In SQL, it's select star from examples where a, x dot a equals v. Is that, is that clear what that set notation refers to? Okay. We're gonna return the leaf with the majority label. Otherwise, we're gonna recurse with that branch. We're gonna recurse on that as the new examples, but without a, because having chosen a, we've already gained all the information we can from a. Okay. There is an exception to this, which is if uh, the actual test is an inequality. If the test is a strict partition, then there's nothing further to be gained because it's pure in that, uh, in that test. So how do we know which attribute is best? If we have two uh, attributes uh, for the same data set, where 29 positive examples and 35 negative examples are presented to us um, on the first call to build DT, which of these is better? Is, is A1 where it gives us 21 and five in one branch and eight and 30 in the other branch better? Or is um, A2, which gives us an 1833 split on the true branch and an 11-2 split on the, uh, on the false branch better? Well, first of all, the reason they're colored green and red is because the uh, left branch has plus as the majority label, the right branch has, or of A1. Um, so A1 true has uh, 20, 21 and five. And notice they marginalize to the original, right? Uh, the original tallies. So um, 21 plus eight is 29, five plus 30 is 35, um, 18 plus 11 is 29, and 33 plus two is 35. Okay, if we look at these, we, and we were to just rank them by purity, uh, we would say that A1, um, in A1, uh, the purity is sandwiched between the purity of A2, right? 11.2 is the most pure, then 21.5, right? If we were just to look at percent of positive or mi minus, right? Max, uh, max percentage. So 11.2 is the most pure, then 21.5, then 38 and 30, then 18 and 33. So they're non-dominating if we look at the if if we look at all the branches, um, but can we collapse that multi-criterion sort of interval bracket to a scalar? Well, yes, we can, but if we just average them, that wouldn't be very fair, right? Uh, to a one, right? Because a two has a very poor branch. It's um, it's not much uh, lower in uh, randomness um, than 21, 29, 35, the original, uh, the original uh, balance. Right? It's 18 and 33. So we'd like to weight by the actual number of examples that are in each branch. So this is the motivation for calculating entropy. Uh, we're, our goal is to measure the uncertainty removed by splitting on the value of attribute A. This is this change, delta H is information gain where H entropy, right? Uh, is uh, capital H here um, is as in the physics notation right? um, and in the statistical thermodynamics notation. H is defined over probability density function P because in our data, H is a function of the disorder of the data, right? The data uh, D contains examples whose frequency of plus and minus labels are denoted P plus and P minus respectively for observed data. The entropy of D relative to a concept is negative P plus log base B, where B is actually an arbitrary base for the unit of entropy that we're using, uh, minus P minus log base B of P minus. Okay, what does this mean? Well, log of a probability is log of a number between zero and one, which is a negative number or non-positive non number, right? Um, and depending on the base, that's, that's the uh, logarithmic slope. So it, the negative of that is a number uh, that is non-negative. Uh, and the information gain is the measure of entropy on the original data minus the conditional entropy. And so this term, summation over B in the values of A, is the expected reduction in entropy, the expected new entropy due to splitting or sorting on A. Okay, so if we sort on A, we had our original entropy and we reduced it by a certain amount, okay? Um, that amount is H minus uh, H of D given A, okay? Um, so let's, 
let's analyze or, or break down this, um, this summation term. We're adding up for each value uh, of A, uh, the size of that branch. So for A1, we have A1 true. Um, and let's take a look. A1 true has, A1 true has uh, 26 out of 64, okay? That's the actual uh, weight that we're gonna give A1 true. Okay. So 21 out of 64 times, uh, the, times the entropy of what? Of dB. So in our um, A1 true branch, we have 21 over 26, log 21 over 26, uh, negative of that, uh, minus five over 26, log five over 26. So we measure the new entropy in that branch, weighted 26 out of 64. Everybody with me? So this is dB is the set of x and d such that x.a equals v, the set of examples in d where attribute has, a has value v. The idea is to partition on a and scale entry to the size of each subset dB. Okay. Um, since information gain always starts with a fixed baseline, right? It's fixed not as in it's constant, but it's the same for every a. We're starting with the same h of d. We're really interested in, therefore, if we're trying to maximize gain, we're trying to minimize um, h of d given a. The lower h of d given a is on the absolute scale. Okay. So what we're going to see is that if we're uh, taking log base b equals two, we're really measuring the number of bits of entropy between zero and one to encode one uh, example from the data set. A totally random stream would, would require uh, would require one bit per example. Um, and that is totally random in that P plus equals P minus equals 0.5, right? So if the probability is uniform, um, then we have uh, uniform priors um, and max likelihood represents our point of maximum uncertainty. Okay. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to drop that as much as possible from, from the peak of what? Okay. So, we're going to reduce entropy to some number that is between zero and one. Okay. The right-hand term, that summation term, is between zero and one. And we know that because on average, conditioning reduces entropy. And you can't lose information by knowing the value of a, of a certain attribute. OK. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. Right. So. Uh, when one says, uh, this is a fundamental concept, kind of like the game of 20 questions, we want to choose an attribute that best partitions the set of remaining training instances. 20 questions uh, gets us uh, greedily to, the, uh, to a leaf that gives us our answer. Okay. And the objective there is to have uh, the information gain from start to finish be however many bits of entropy were in the original data. So we want, in other words, the conditional entropy at, at leaves to be ideally zero um, and to be able to give a definitive answer at each leaf. So we can actually do this with classification trees as well if we use axis parallel inequalities like this, where we say the first, the, the root is test whether x is less than three. So you can see the, the vertical line of x equals three has a left side and a right side. Okay. In the no case, we have the right side, and if we test if y is greater than seven, if the answer is no, then we're in this sort of open, open. Uh, um, supposing that all our examples are in the first quadrant, it's still open on the right side of the box. Right? Um, we have this region that is minus. Okay, and if the answer is x is less than x is not less than three, greater than or equal to three, and y is uh, greater than seven then we have a plus at right, the upper right-hand corner. Uh, these instances are usually represented using discrete valued attributes, right? They are either nominal, such as the traffic light is red, yellow, or green, or they're quantized, such as this person's income is low, medium, or high. So there's been a step of vector quantization or scalar quantization already to form our input features. Uh, we can handle numerical values for input either by discretization, by actually doing vector or scalar quantization, meaning binning, histogramming, um, or clustering. Uh, 
Um, and we can use Gaussian mixture models or other kinds of ways to do that discretization as, as you've seen in other chapters on unsupervised learning. But we can also use just thresholds or inequality tests to split the data. Okay, and there we want to use the max entropy split. Okay. And so classification um, trees can still be computed the same way that we can find a max entropy uh, inequality. This is a special case of CART, which is why I'm showing you right here. So let's look at what we can do with the results of a decision tree to validate the results and also to prune it and get uh, perhaps human understandable rules as a result. So the justification for pruning is first and foremost overfitting control. Um, Occam's razor says entities sh shall not be multiplied without necessity, right? Um, which in machine learning, uh, in machine learning uh, conceptualization means that we have either a preference for a simpler decision tree, which we can get by using greedy optimization and stopping when we should, as, but, but no later. Um, and so we need, we need to define a stopping criterion um, or a representation bias. So a representation bias could be um, imposing a maximum tree depth or um, actually penalizing for the depth of the tree. So, so the question is whether this is well-defined, right? There's only a combinatorial, weak combinatorial support for Occam's razor itself until we start to look at um, probability and minimum description of. So let's look at this more from an empirical uh, stance. Okay, overfitting uh, is the problem of, in decision tree induction of fitting training data too closely. In, in general, it means there exists some hypothesis uh, alternative to ours that does worse on training data, but better on test data, right? uh, whose true error is lower. And we can estimate true error in turn using validation data that we didn't train on um, or on uh, using uh, test data. So can we use the validation data to determine a stopping criterion? Okay, or to actually prune the tree after it has already overfit. So this breaks down into overfitting prevention, avoidance, and recovery. Prevention, as in the case of deadlock prevention, uh, means processes don't actually request things that can deadlock. In the case of uh, virus prevention, it means that we don't let uh, untrusted uh, programs uh, have access to storage and they can't write to our storage. They can't actually transfer files, um, read or write files. Um, and so that trust model uh, can be our prevention model. Um, avoidance means that we want to actually, uh, so prevention in decision tree induction means either using regularization, L1 and L2 loss, which we've already seen for uh, linear discriminants, or feature subset selection, which we can use either as a wrapper or we can just sample free feature subsets and use some kind of bootstrap analysis, which is what we're gonna see with random forest. Uh, we can avoid overfitting, which means allowing a problem to theoretically occur, but sidestepping it at the last moment, right? So in, in deadlock avoidance, uh, processes can request any um, resources, but if it's about to close a loop, we detect that a loop is about to close and we say, roll back one of these, okay? And then it becomes an issue of fairness and liveness. So uh, in computer virus avoidance, there's usually a terminate and stay resident program, such as your antivirus. Um, your antivirus could be um, something like malware bytes, Avast, Kaspersky, McAfee, some um, trend micro, some, some program that actually says, I'm going to check the checksum um, of the program that is being run, um, and I'm going to, to not let it write if it doesn't match a, a, uh, a signature. So I can use a cryptographic checksum and, and check that it, uh, it's trusted. Uh, without a self-signed certificate or a trust model, I'm going to actually say, you can, you can send me messages, uh, but I'm going to see whether uh, you are who you say you are based on um, some registered signature uh, for this trusted program. Uh, so that in, in uh, decision tree induction, that's cross-validation, right? We hold out some data, 
we validate and we say stop if the cross the validation set accuracy is starting to drop, even if the training set accuracy is, is continuing to drop. Sorry, if the validation set accuracy starts to uh, accuracy starts to drop or the error starts to go up. Okay, so what's detection and recovery? This is what we mean by post pruning. Okay, and det detection and recovery in in uh, deadlock is actually allowing deadlock to occur, but just monitoring uh, progress and seeing that no uh, process has actually finished, right? Uh, and if we use an empirical criterion, we can say, we're just gonna um, make one of them roll back um, and kill one job and make it roll back because we infer that a, uh, a resource cycle has closed in the resource allocation graph. Uh, in computer virus detection, detection and recovery means the, your disk is already infected, right? Um, and we're gonna scan for viral signatures rather than look for, use cryptographic checksums to validate or, or certificates to validate the, um, the legitimacy of a program that wants to run. Um, we've already downloaded something and we're just looking for it in order to disinfect it. Okay, how do we recover from overfitting? Well, if we've learned our decision tree already, we wanna roll back, we wanna experimentally prune. So this is what we mean by rule post pruning. Okay. Um, so here's a tree that may have overfit. Um, it's the decision tree concept for, is today a good day to play tennis? There are three uh, features that we tested initially. Outlook with branches, sunny, overcast, and rain. Notice that here we have 14, uh, 14 examples, nine plus and five minus. We split them. Uh, we hit the base case of um, all the examples have the same label. Right um, in Outlook equals overcast, so we just return positive. We return that label, okay. And in the other two labels, we keep on recursing. Uh, we test a different attribute, and in the case of sunny Outlook equals sunny, humidity equals normal, we have this um, situation where we have small sample statistics, right? We have two plus and one minus, and so we could just say, well, two out of three is good enough. But if our 15th example is, is that one negative example, we could further test a fourth attribute. Okay, we only had four attributes, outlook, humidity, wind, and temperature. If we temp test temperature, we're gonna get hot, no, okay, uh, zero, one minus. Uh, temperature mild is a yes, one, zero. And cool uh, is a yes with one, zero. Okay. So what the problem is, is that uh, we actually have singletons at these at the leaves, which might be just fitting noise or can coincidental regularity. Also, the example is noisy because the correct label is actually plus. So the previously constructed tree misclassifies it. But how can we revise this? We can say, well, we want incremental learning. We're going to go ahead and learn another feature. But we're, we may find that on our validation data, uh, that's one feature too far. So what we can do is we can say, well, what would happen to the validation data if I rolled back temperature, if I just undid it? Right? So we can prevent by regularization and feature subset selection, picking features that are relevant. We can avoid by holding out a validation set. In this case, we should have stopped. We could have stopped anywhere between five nodes and 15 nodes. Okay? It starts to do markedly worse on test data around 15 nodes. Okay, even though it's not a monotonic decrease in, in the accurate test set accuracy. So we can select, we can measure performance over the training data and, and validation set, and we can balance between the size of the tree and the compressed size according to an optimal coding scheme of the number of misclassifications. This is Rissanen's minimum description length, which corresponds to the Bayesian information criteria. Um, so that's actually beyond the scope of chapter 18. Um, Murphy does talk about um, regularization um, and, and pruning. So what is pruning? Grow the tree, remove nodes that seem not to have sufficient evidence. This is in the case of, as Murphy notes, the bias variance decomposition, because the pruned tree also has a bias. The bias is towards um, greedy selection of features. Okay, And if the features are correlated, you've already picked them and you've already picked them on a one by one basis. Um, so pruning isn't going to fix that. You have to backtrack further than that. You have to try out different subsets in order to actually fix that. So the, this avoidance technique 
um, we can use post pruning or reduced error pruning. The, the pseudo code is here. We build a complete decision tree after we've partitioned into detrain and devalidation. Use detrain to build the tree using build DT or ID3. Until the accuracy increases on validation, do what this picture shows. Cut one of the nodes for each non-leaf node candidate, each internal candidate, try pruning it. Okay, you can prune one or you can prune far in, in uh, on the interior. And when you prune, you roll up everything and you act as if you decided to stop there. Okay, so you're gonna use the uh, majority label. Okay, with the, the uh, and you're gonna choose a tree that had the highest value of accuracy with rollback. So you're gonna learn in two phases, learn top down, learn all of the nodes in the decision tree, and then prune uh, from bottom up. This is one way to do pruning. It's tree post pruning. The other one is the more popular one. Okay. Um, it's the one that's used in C4.5, C5.0, or Quinlan's suite of learning algorithms, J48, which is part of Weka. It's also used in scikit-learn by default and in the Spark-based Apache library MLlib. Um, and here's how it works. You infer tree uh, T from the data set D using ID3, growing it until it's fit as well as possible, allowing overfitting to happen, uh, converting t it can then convert T into an equivalent set of rules, one for every root to leaf path, prune or generalize every rule independently by deleting preconditions whose deletion improves the, the, that rule's estimated accuracy and then sort the pruned rules. Okay. Um, so this is very similar to a classifier system um, in genetic algorithms. Uh, how do we get every root to leaf path. Well, we just do an in-order traversal, right? Outlook equals sunny and humidity equals high implies play tennis equals no. Outlook equals sunny and humidity equals normal implies play tennis equals yes. Outlook equals overcast implies play tennis equals yes, etc. So there are five root to leaf paths because there's five leaves. And what we can do is we can prune, for example, outlook equals sunny from the uh, sunny high rule but not from the sunny normal rule. So we could drop one of the preconditions from one rule, but not from the other. This independent pruning allows maximum flexibility in the propositional representation that we're learning. Um, but it can cause incoherence in the actual uh, set of rules that we have because of uh, the potential redundancy that can result. Okay. So now let's jump into um, Murphy book one and let's take a look at the four sections or the six sections of this chapter. Okay, first, now that we've seen everything that decision trees do, it's actually uh, very easy for me to introduce section 18.1 on CART. Okay, and then I'm going to show you how ensemble learning um, and then uh, bagging random forest and boosting, I grouped into one, even though I did actually write slides for each um, and, and uh, adapt slides from Murphy's book um, for each of 18.34 and five, but you'll see that that's one, uh, one block, okay, one section of this uh, tutorial. And then the last one is on um, in how do we actually interpret uh, tree ensembles. So let's get started with CART. What's the difference between CART and ID3. Well, first let's understand what a regression tree is. It's similar to that numerical input classification tree. We use any univariate inequalities and interior no nodes, which produce axis parallel splits, which you can see in figure 18.1 right below this. Right? And then the leaves are regressors. They're actually the average target or training of the output of the region. In other words, we have uh, a sequence of tests such as is X1 uh, less than or equal to T1, uh, yes and no, okay? Um, so in the, uh, in the no case, we go left, and um, in the right yes case, we go right, okay? If uh, X is uh, greater than T1 um, and greater than T2, um, then uh, X2 is greater than T2, then R1 uh, is our first leaf, right? So we've got these leaves, um, that you can see uh, that are each each have their own color. And the Rs are the actual uh, regressors we've chosen. Okay. In other words, if we tested X1 and X2, then R1 is based on X1 and X2, and we're going to fit a regress regressor uh, W. Okay, so the regression tree is defined by F of X theta is summation from J equals one to J of WJ times the identity function X 
in RJ. Okay, that, what does that mean? That means that we're going to uh, learn a weight and we're going to uh, use a Dirac Delta in inclusion. This is an identity uh, function, right? In other words, it's a, a predicate. Uh, it's a function that is zero if X is not in RJ. Um, so X, uh, X1 and X2, we had X1 and X2, right? And we had four thresholds, T1, T2, T3, T4 in this tree, okay? Um, in the R branch, we use T1 and X1 and X2, okay? Um, and in the uh, other branches, we, uh, in each of these branches, we use all of them, but we might end up only needing some of the Xs, right? So if we have more Xs, um, the ones that are used to actually find a cell uh, are the ones that we actually use in our regression line that we fit. So, um, Ramon asks, uh, are regression trees always binary? Uh, they're binary if it's an inequality. Uh, we can also use uh, ternary decision trees if we partition it into intervals, but we need, a, um, we need a system for partitioning into intervals. So the answer is it does not strictly have to be interval-based. CART itself is implemented with binary, uh, because, binary uh, interior nodes because uh, it uh, it's consists of a regressor that is fit using half spaces and they're all axis aligned, right? Um, so if you use intervals uh, or other partitions, you're basically covering it using a different uh, using a different hypothesis language. Okay, just as in computational learning theory, we talk about learning with uh, half spaces versus learning with intervals on the half spaces on the on the real number line versus intervals on the real number line. Generally, um, there we don't go far beyond. Uh, don't go far beyond three, and um, we, generally we never go beyond three, and typically don't go beyond two sided. Okay, so cart like models um, can also use other functions at the leaves other than linear regression. So if you look at KDD Cup from 1998, it's a uh, target marketing um, which predicts how much a donor is going to donate. And it first determines, it first partitions and classifies someone as a donor or not. And the, don the non-donor is going to have a predicted donation of zero and all of the donors are gonna get partitioned into low or high, okay? And then um, a naive Bayes classifier ended up um, uh, being the best uh, regressor at the leaves. You can also use other uh, non-generative regressors such as this uh, di discriminative regressor um, that uh, that is the leaf here. Okay. So this is just linear re regression. You can see that it just learns wj at the end. Okay. Uh, you could also use su support vector regression where the wj's are, instead of using the i's, we're going to actually take all the data points in that cell, but we're going to um, find the support vectors. Um, so those are all things that we can do um, using, using a tree structure. If we have cart with binary labels, that's binary labels, okay, uh, a little different from what uh, Raymond was saying, right? So Raymond was saying, um, uh, are regression trees always linear? Well, if they're discrete, uh, if they're rather uh, nominal features, right, like color equals blue, red, or other, then we still have to use our one hot encoding. Okay, so cart can do uh, this. Um, usually what you do then is you have uh, multiple tests, right? Blue, non-blue, red, non-red, right? You can do one versus red encoding, uh, one versus rest encoding, or you can do one hot encoding. Okay. So uh, a better answer to Raymond's question is uh, you, you can use binary only um, in theory, but if you want a more efficient representation for multi-valued multi attributes, uh, you should use one hot encoding rather than a uh, one versus rest encoding. Okay, so what happens here? Well, you have a hypothetical classification tree that's fitted to this data, and a leaf here means there's n1 positive examples and n not negative examples. You can then use naive Bayes or other means uh, to actually find argmax of this probability, right? So if we want to actually use a probabilistic model at the leaf, we've actually used the partitioning work or the partitioning function of these nodes to take us down to the leaves and then we can uh, use a statistical learning um, model at the leaves. Okay, so how do we do it? We minimize uh, J theta or L theta 
um, which is a loss function computed on each yn. Okay, one, n equals one to capital N, or as I use it, m. Okay, um, summation j equals one to capital J, uh, or as I use capital uh, uh, lowercase n, um, of L y m w i or L y n w j. Now there are other loss functions besides conditional entropy. They use a cost function, which is one over the size of the data set, summation of some squared loss. Right? And from that, you can use the Gini index, okay, where we have the empirical distribution over class labels. This is just a multinomial estimator. Instead, this is the Gini index. And if you have read section 18.1, you see that in equation 18.8, .8, which comes before entropy, uh, Murphy introduces Gini index because the empirical distribution, if you look at it totally probabilistically, it's, it's more straightforward. Uh, entropy is a little easier to understand if we're talking about information gain and uncertainty, whereas if we're talking about the distribution as an intrinsic, the Gini coefficient is, is more natural. Okay, this is why I showed you entropy first. So going back to entropy, um, you can actually uh, learn the iris data set this way. Um, and uh, sorry, I skipped over the uh, entropy slide. The entropy slide, we can define cost as entropy or deviance of the node, which is the expectation of log P. And the reason he does it afterwards is because he's actually invoking the information theoretic definition of entropy, which is the expectation of log P. That's the actual definition because log optimal is lower bound. Okay, it's a concave downward function. It looks like this as a function of, uh, of a, uh, any Boolean um, variable. Okay, in this case, our um, class label, our um, concept learning class label. And now we have our formula, right? H of D given A is the second term, summation of the weighted cost times H for that branch. Okay, and then we have to average it right, over each branch. Any questions about gain? Gain is cost minus base entropy and cost is always the same. It's always H of D for that, for that attribute at that interior node. So then we can visualize decision trees are actually, they actually break things down, um, you know, in, in cart, they break things down in axis aligned ways. So they are more, more brittle than uh, other kinds of uh, directionally oriented polytopes and, uh, and uh, um, even KD trees. Um, so what decision trees tend to rely on is some feature transformation or selection process. Uh, and this is where ensemble learning and bagging random forests and boosting come in. Okay. The problem is that decision trees have high variance and we need to reduce this variance. So the first idea is to regularize or stop early um, and um, use rule or tree post pruning, which we saw before. The second idea is to use more trees and take the average. Okay. And so uh, as Murphy says, we're always estimating F of Y given X uh, which is one over the number of models times summation of the uh, f of m, which is the density function, right, for that mth base model. Okay. Um, so if we uh, if we have a finite number of these, we can take a probability mass function, total probability mass function. So the limitation is that these models have the same bias as the base model. Okay. If we just say we're going to learn with uh, the same tree but we're gonna sample the data differently, uh, there's a bias variance trade-off. Okay. But stacking, bagging, and boosting are all variations on this that are called committee machines or committee methods. Okay. Um, so Simon Haken in his neural networks book calls them committee machines. These are static committee machines as opposed to mixture models that actually look at X. Okay. Um, here, we're gonna just sample. Okay. And we're gonna sample without regards to what exactly X is. Um, here, for example, stack generalization takes the idea that each inducer, the leaves here, are trees. Each one uses a subsample of D. We're going to train the combiner on the validation segment. In other words, we're going to train a bunch of little trees on the original, on 80% of the original data. We're going to hold 20% of the data out and use it to say, which tree should I trust? How are we going to get different answers? Well, we're going to actually train in two passes, we're going to train all of the inducers, and then we're going to say, uh, did, did this sample actually include um, something that has uh, fewer of the examples that another inducer can learn well? 
Okay, so we want to make sure that if the trees are brittle and are very high in variance, that we can actually deal with that variance by using a hierarchy of, of trees. So the, the actual pseudocode is like this. We actually take our data set, we break it up into, M, uh, into K pieces. We train by sampling with replacement uh, as, as we do in K-fold cross-validation by holding out that piece. And then we train the combiner using that remaining piece. So it's sort of like cross-validation with a combiner that you, uh, that you actually train uh, that is it's also a tree. Okay. Um, so this function, sample with replacement, is also used in bagging. Okay. Uh, but instead of being many bootstrap samples that we aggregate, uh, there's just uh, k pieces. So it's, it's more like cross-validation than like a completely bootstrap-based method. OK, so what is bagging? Any questions about stacking? That's just an example of ensemble averaging, how we can actually average. Okay, and Kevin gives the pure form of that, which is the uh, which is just the linear average, the unweighted average. And we're going to do the same thing with bootstrap aggregating. So this is an application of the statistical technique of bootstrap sampling. We want to start up by having M training examples, some of which are really bad for our decision tree. We're going to draw an equal number of examples at random with replacement from D. So uh, there's, there's a limit theory theorem-based proof that in a sample of size identical to the original, it's expected to retain 0.632 um, of the original examples and leave out the remainder. So about 0.3638 um, of the examples. So if you had 1,000 examples, you're expected to keep 700, um, uh, 632 and lose 368. Okay, 368 of them don't get sampled. Um, and uh, 732 unique ones, uh, 632 unique ones are expected with some of them being um, seen more than once. Um, so you can create K of those bootstrap samples. You train a distinct, in this case, tree on each one to produce K classifiers. And then you just take a vote. So what's the idea? The idea is that two heads are better than one. K heads are better than one. Um, you produce multiple classifiers from the same data set. You can use the same inducer. In this case, you do, because it's we're, we're using just bagging with decision trees or bagging with carts. Differences in samples will smooth out the sensitivity of both the, the learning algorithm, in this case, ID3, and the hypothesis language, in this case, cart or a decision tree, to the data set D. So the pseudocode is sample with replacement, train the set, train the inducer, and make return a closure that makes a predictor that votes, takes the majority vote. Okay. Um, so sampling with replacement just returns M data points sampled identically, uh, independently, and identically distributed uniformly from D. So Bryman showed that if you take a sample S of labeled data, do this 100 times and report the average, divide it into a test set and a training set, learn the decision tree from the training set, create a bootstrap sample, learn the decision tree, prune using the data set as validation. Uh, the error of the majority vote using trees to classify the T is lower. Okay, this, the, uh, the um, and show, he shows, uh, Quinlan shows this result empirically using the uh, classic examples in the UCI uh, machine learning database repository. So when should this help? It helps when the learner is unstable and, and decision trees are somewhat unstable, which means that a small change to the training set causes a large change in the output hypothesis. This is true for decision trees, for, uh, for some neural networks, perceptrons, definitely. Um, some uh, uh, multi-layer perceptrons, uh, not necessarily for um, convolutional neural networks, but that's because of the convolutional neural network being trained on a very large number of uh, data points um, and also making use of um, autoencoders. Okay, um, and the probabilistic benefits of that are beyond the scope of this chapter. So bagging experimentally is experimentally shown mostly by Quinlan and Bryman in the 90s uh, that it can help substantially for unstable learners and somewhat degrade results for stable learners. So even though CART actually dates back to the 60s and 70s, um, some of the late breakthroughs um, from Bryman, Freund, and Shapire and um, uh, Friedman and Olshin. Bryman Friedman and Olshin is the uh, uh, 
paper that is cited in Murphy's uh, figures um, in this chapter. So Mer Bryman, as one of his final contributions, he passed away um, uh, some years ago, um, developed uh, the technique of bagged random forests. Okay, and the difference, first of all, the idea is bagging with decision trees, but on a random subset of features. So instead of on all the features. So it does better than bagging because it does ensemble averaging where at, on, of FM, where FM is the mth tree and BM is the corresponding weight, but random subsets increase robustness in case of irrelevant features. And that's shown empirically using a lot of the, the validation um, methods that Bryman uh, developed. So the advantage is it can help reduce variance via both bagging and a regularization-based feature subset selection regime. The trade-off is you still retain the bias of decision trees. Right? You can't get away from greediness. There, there are only two ways to get away from greediness. One is measure gain in terms of a subset score, which is going to run afoul of NP hardness. Um, and uh, the other is to actually look at other backtracking methods. So bi-directional search, uh, wrappers um, for feature subset selection. Um, those kinds of hofting race methods are empirically more robust, but they cost data and they cost a lot of computation time. So your model, overall model complexity also increases because now you've trained K trees and your results are from K trees and you can't get around that just like you can't get around the fact that little post pruning can cause some noise and incoherence and redundancy. Any questions? So finally, we're going to look at boosting. The idea behind boosting is to pay attention to past mistakes. We use a cascade of trees. We're going to penalize the downstream misclassifications more. In other words, we're going to feed it to a first tree and then give all the ones that get, gets wrong on training data to the next tree and the next tree and the next tree. That's called boosting by filter. Okay. Um, Murphy talks very little about that. Mitchell talks a little, a little bit more. Um, the second technique is to say, okay, so the first tree is going to get uh, run on validation data every time, uh, or um, yeah, it's going to, we're going to look at the amount of noise, right? Um, the ones it still gets wrong, we're going to double the penalty and we're going to throw it back and train another tree. Right. So we're going to still sample from that distribution, but we're going to resample in proportion to misclassification. Um, again, Murphy doesn't talk very much about that. Murphy concentrates almost all uh, the uh, material in this section in, um, 18, uh, in chapter 18 uh, is, uh, is to actually reweight, which means that every time you make a mistake, you're just going to double the loss, okay? Right, exponential loss. So if you do adaptive bo boosting, boosting of the loss function, um, that's called eta boost. So at, at step M, you can see that the loss function is an exponential loss function of the number of misclassifications, where it's an exponential function of, of the of the wrong answers, right? So you've got labels y i plus one for positive, minus one for negative. Every time it makes a mistake. It's going to uh, calculate an exponential function of the number of times it has happened, that mistake has happened. So the pseudocode for the algorithm is algorithm eight in this chapter. It computes this reweighting, and that's what eta boost M1 is. It's exponential loss with binary classification, using that to compute a new tree. So notice the line three, fit a new classifier to the training set. Okay, this is still gonna result in a collection of trees. It's still an ensemble method. But the ensemble method, this committee, is built using uh, using the uh, first one as a, a sort of filter, uh, or in, in this case, to, to compute the reweighting, right? to compute the, the uh, uh, so the previous ensemble is the, uh, or the upstream ensemble is the, is the uh, uh, input to the exponential loss. So this should get better, right? What, we, what we're trying to do is eat, what, when you filter, you're trying to concentrate your time. It's sort of like taking a standardized exam and you make a, a, a practice exam on all the ones you missed. So it's kind of strength training. You're, you're practicing on the ones that were hard. Okay, um, if, you, uh, if you resample, you're basically trying to maintain realism in the, in the distribution of questions, but still 
oversampling the ones that you missed before. And if you're reweighting, you're giving yourself, you're, you're deducting more points for each one you miss. So those are, those are the actual how, great, uh, how boosting works. Um, Murphy concludes by showing that there's actually, if we use squared error, ex, absolute error, exponential loss, binary log loss, or multi-class log loss, we get all different kinds of gradient boosting algorithms. And so the generic gradient boosting algorithm just says, compute a gradient residual, use the weak learner to compute this new FM, and then update to FM. And the version of this uh, that actually uh, is used with decision trees actually does better than random forest or bagging. And you can see bagging, boosting, and random forest all give improvements over um, as, as we increase the number of trees up to a point of diminishing returns. This is on a specific concrete data set called the email corpus um, that, uh, that Murphy uses. So how do we actually make sense of these tree ensembles? Um, Murphy shows two ways. One is just by um, visualizing feature importance using a heat map. So for a si single decision tree, we actually find the gain in accuracy for each feature and it's univariate gain in accuracy is how hot it is. And using this heat map, we can see um, important features on a grid. And this is for MNIST, so it's handwritten di digits and we're looking for which of the digits actually are most relevant. Um, we can also look at feature importance um, just by sorting keywords by how important they are. So spam or not, okay? And there's some uh, long tail uh, features that might be actually uh, pruned if we try to uh, prevent overfitting. And then there are specific things that are very, very important. Okay. Um, we can also look at indi individual uh, marginal relevance. Okay, which is uh, computed using this partial dependency plot. So we marginalize out all the features, we just plot to F bar, okay, um, the, um, and we look at, in this case, the, the probability, posterior probability of the uh, label that we want for that, for that feature. Uh, and we look at the odd log odds of our target class, in this case, spam or not spam, for important predictors such as, does the title contain an exclamation point? Uh, does it contain remove? Like you can remove yourself from this uh, list. Okay. Um, and uh, so if it's a mailing list, you know, remove is anti-correlated with, right? Um, and is it from a .edu domain? Okay. And so on, right? These are, these, are the, uh, these are the actual most relevant features that were found using decision tree induction. Um, and so uh, to finish up, uh, I wanted to show you how you can use decision trees. Uh, decision trees are covered in this section of Scikit-Learn, I, I uh, grabbed this to this morning from the uh, Scikit-Learn latest documentation. Um, there's some tutorials in Scikit-Learn uh, and the code is very easy to use. You just import tree and tree has, is, uh, has within it a decision tree classifier that you can instantiate. And you can of course do a dot fit on the data in the, in the traditional shape of classifier uh, or, or rather input and target and dot predict to actually, uh, to actually classify. Now that only generates your YIs, okay, um, or YJs. Uh, if you want to see the actual uh, results, there's a lot of tree visualization algorithms that are built into scikit-learn as well. Uh, I wanted to finish by mentioning a, something that's in section 18.6, which is on uh, five, which is the state of the field in boosting. And that's called XGBoost. That's one of the, the top performing boosting algorithms at present. It does regularization and it the X stands for extreme gradient boosting um, where they use uh, the, uh, uh, the computer loss function for evaluating different tree structures. This is where uh, there's the most mass, okay? Um, because he actually shows what the regularizer is. Um, as with L lasso regression and ridge regression, they're really just fancy names for using L1 loss, L2 loss, LP loss, a uh, com convex combination of L1 and L2 loss, and then computing the gain for that. So it's really all just about doing the matrix uh, algebra for, for computing that, optimizing that loss and the numerical analysis to, to optimize for that loss. But XGBoost is seeing a lot, a lot of um, publicity right now because it's, uh, it's uh, currently uh, surpasses in many cases, support vector machines and random forests. Uh, which are in turn some uh, two of the uh, the best performing general case 
um, sort of across a lot of common shallow learning test beds. Okay, so, uh, among, among the shallow learning algorithms and shallow learning we, we still use in a lot of cases because it scales well, um, or because we don't actually have a lot of data, right? if we have a data poor domain. So these are reasons to do, use decision trees, reasons to use bagging, boosting, and um, random forests and stacking. Um, and I welcome any questions if you have any follow-up questions. So this is, uh, I think, a, a chapter that is uh, very recognizable when you actually pull any um, machine learning code. You're welcome. And, uh, and, uh, and you'll see uh, that not only scikit-learn and mllib um, have these built in, but many uh, uh, classical uh, machine learning uh, packages, uh, including C4.5 itself. Ray and I were just reminiscing uh, um, today about how there used to be a floppy disk in the back of uh, uh, C4.5. Um, it wasn't even a CD. I think it really was a floppy disk. And actually, it had a code listing, which is which is unheard of now, because um, now you just go to um, now you just go to uh, uh, a GitHub repository and pull the code. Any questions? Folks, uh, please feel free to ask any questions you have before we wrap up. Um, Bill, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. You're most um, welcome. Yeah, it was uh, it was really um, really informative and really well presented. So. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I'll try to be back for other uh, chapters that we're doing. Uh, I will definitely be watching some of the other chapters um, because uh, some of them I have covered before in my machine learning class, but I'd like to see how to, uh, I, I'm still uh, practicing. Next year will be the, the first year I actually teach uh, my machine learning class using Murphy's book one. Um, and um, uh, other than Kevin himself, I, I, uh, I really would like to hear from all of you uh, how you, um, what you got out of each chapter, especially the deep learning ones, but not limited to, to the deep learning ones. Um, and some chapters I'm, uh, I'm just adding. Uh, Michael asks how feature selection is used and calculated with trees. XGBoost has it built in. That's right. Um, so generally what we do is validation set accuracy. Um, so um, uh, with uh, some, sort, some form um, of local search operator, Okay, so um, in in the case of um, for for basic ID three and cart, um, you basically start uh, in the same way that uh, regression does, uh, either with uh, forward selection or backwards elimination. In backward elimination, you start with all uh, features. In forward selection, you start with none. You start with the empty set. Uh, you uh, add or subtract one at a time. And you um, backtrack by uh, adding back by pruning forward selection or adding back for backward elimination. Um, and what you do, what you're comparing Uh, is the uh, validation set loss for multiple TV folds or multiple bootstrap samples. Um, and generally, the Hofting race that I mentioned is where you plot the confidence interval. And stop 
only when the intervals for one subset and its neighbor or successor. That is its parent or child in the search space. Do not overlap. So if one clearly beats the other, then you can say, okay, it's a win. I can stop now, right? Otherwise, um, it's inconclusive. So you need to keep on taking samples, but you can stop when the confidence, inter the confidence intervals uh, don't overlap. If you have a tie, if you have an actual tie, you can also stop. So did I answer your question, Mike? So these are built into Weka. Um, so you'll see this uh, built into, um, it's calculated automatically, yeah. Um, so yes, some of these feature subsets, these are, are built into Weka and SK Learn. Um, and the, the way they're built in, you'll see that in Weka, it's called um, uh, a, a meta learning wrapper. Um, and the actual wrapped inducer with uh, decision tree as wrapped inducer. In, uh, in scikit-learn, it is indeed, when you use SG, XGBoost, uh, yes. So in XGBoost, you are using an information gain. Uh, and Murphy talks about that um, in, in how he derives that gain. Okay, now the gain I showed you, the gain I showed you in the last slide was Genie. Okay. Um, but yes, um, in, in the book. Um, so I have a, a question for you. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Quinlan's paper on ID3 came out in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a time where we had neither the data sets nor the computational resources that we have today. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned at one point during your presentation that um, if we're short of data, um, if we don't have a lot of data, um, you know, we might consider using decision trees and I guess I'm wondering if anybody's actually tried decision trees on the kind of data sets that are used to train, you know, BERT and all these GPT-3, all these, you know, huge uh, language models. Um, the question was, uh, have, are there test beds that-, that Yeah, has anybody, has anybody actually applied decision tree learning to these? Incredibly large data sets. <laughs> MNIST, yes. Um, I'm not aware that uh, you, you can't really do it effectively with ImageNet without uh, without using some sparse or local coding. Um, right. So um, and 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 ID3 doesn't actually scale that well. Um, okay. So uh, so the answer is um, uh, I, uh, there has been work um, on scaling uh, the work of uh, Johannes Gerke. Um, uh, who's at Cornell now, um, uh, and and Jawe Han at Illinois. Um, when you say they don't scale as well, are you talking in terms of number of features, or just um, number of um, the, the, mostly mostly the validation, the cost of validation, the wrappers you have to use. Um, okay. uh, so with uh, so. So uh, scale issues include uh, validation. They include uh, subset, feature subsets. Okay. So if you're gonna do subset importance or anything like that, then you start to run afoul of the exponential growth. Right? Um, uh, and, uh, and then also, um, so you have these issues of correlation as well. Um, anytime you have to relax the, the independence assumption and the greediness, yeah. Um, yeah. you start to pay for it, right? right. Uh, 
right? So these are the things that decision trees are intrinsically vulnerable to by by their uh, by the the shared uh, greediness of the learning yeah. algorithm. So um, so it's not that the data sets don't exist that they could be used on. It's that um, uh, there's a point of diminishing returns um, at the scale you need to use validation data, uh, right? So it, when you start to have to use a lot of validation data um, uh, to do the training, um, and that becomes a multiplier, uh, it doesn't it doesn't scale as well. So you could run a straight ID three on you know sparse and local coding of the ImageNet, um, but it probably wouldn't do too well. So when I say sparse coding, um, I mean um, like a visual bag of words. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting because um, um, there was a point in time where LMPs didn't really scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things we got out of deep learning is this idea of like hierarchical feature extraction. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if anybody's ever thought of doing kind of like um, hierarchical decision trees you know, where the first decision tree would be extracting features to pass to the next one. Um, it, it just seems like something that's- there, there, That's related to the idea of um, uh, the uh, hierarchical mixture model, uh, hierarchical yeah. uh, mixture of experts. Um, yeah. So that's a soft decision tree and they use soft max laws um, okay. uh, by uh, Michael I. Jordan and-, and uh, Okay, so people have actually thought of thought of this. Okay. Yeah, uh, this came out at around I think around ninety one. Okay. Um, okay, if you look at this, is a soft decision tree. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I think Kevin uh, covers it under mixture models. Okay. Okay, great. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I, I'm really disappointed that there aren't more people here because um, Michael asks you, you if gave... I'm familiar with Light GPM uh, and why it's faster than the XG Boost. I've heard of it, but I don't know very much about it. Um, that is something I will have to look into. Um, I will follow up on that. I um, I need to go teach uh, my machine learning class. Right. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, and uh, I will see you again. Okay. Thank Thanks you very coming. much, William, for an awesome presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next week. Cheers. <laughs>